Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Shake Sales. I'm your host, Maggie Bloom, the sales evangelist at Mailshake. And today I am super excited to talk with David Primer about focusing on the problems in sales. So David is the founder of Cerebral Selling, the author of Sell the Way You Buy, which I love that title for a book. And he's a research scientist turned tech entrepreneur. So super excited to have David here. Thanks so much for being here. Do you mind taking some time to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, no, it's great to be with you, Maggie. Thanks for inviting me. I, I think your intro is great. You know, like everyone else, I, uh, I got into sales by accident. You know, no one, no one goes to school for this. And I joined a startup at the turn of the dot-com boom, like around 1999, 2000. Uh, I started my career, as you said, as a research scientist and absolutely fell in love with sales because it was so much like a science and engineering problem. Like there's all these variables and it's really complicated. Um, but I realized over the course of time, having done a number of startups that I, you know, my, one of my companies was acquired by Salesforce and I worked at Salesforce for five years that, you know, I, I love sales, but I don't, I don't like talking to salespeople. And I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a lot of people do either. And yeah. un unfortunately, a lot of things that we've been learning and taught in sales over the years is actually not good. So I kind of set out on this mission to do my part to rehabilitate the world of sales by diving back into kind of like the science and empathy based tactics that have been shown to work the best and that people can execute with high conviction. So that's what I do. Amazing. Yeah. And I completely agree with you as being a salesperson. I sell to other salespeople. So I talk about sales a lot. And as you do the same too, but <laughs> Yeah, there's some things that, you know, we go through and processes that are outdated, I think, in, in my mind, but they're still there. People are still teaching them to others. So I just love that you put yourself in the position of um, the buyer's part of this whole process. And like you said, kind of having that scientific background helps, which it's funny how we all fall into it and how we all bring our different strengths. You know, a lot of people that come from the theater background into sales, obviously they have like an amazing strength in there too. but. Um, yeah, super interested to talk about this today. And David, I came across his YouTube videos where he goes into more depth about this. So if anyone's interested in checking it out, checking that out later, go for it. But yeah, to get right into it, uh, you know, we're going through an economic downturn right now. People are getting laid off from companies. You know, people aren't bringing in as much revenue to their businesses. So to start it off, why do you think teams are struggling during this economic downturn? Yeah, well, I think in any economic downturn, you know, wallets get tightened and there's a lot more scrutiny on certain purchases. And, you know, one of the things that is kind of problematic is that in good times, you know, when companies have money and, you know, things are generally OK, a lot of the things that we do in sales, which are not the best, sometimes get covered up by the fact <laughs> that, you know, times are good. You know, like imagine, you know, maybe there's someone out there who's you know sold Zoom at the, mm -hmm. you know, the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, the thing is flying off the shelves and they're like, look how great a salesperson I am. Like yeah. I'm selling all this stuff, <laughs> it, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, when, when things get tougher, all of a sudden, and of course that's like a, you know, that would be a unicorn kind of example, but you know, when companies have money, they're willing to kind of take greater risks in, in making investments. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to try as hard. And sometimes, you know, if you have an amazing product and it's whiz bang and space age, Again, like that can sometimes obfuscate some of the challenges that you're having in your sales motion. And so what's happening now is that, you know, when people are struggling when people are losing their jobs and, and you know, people are not just, uh, you know, uh, challenged in their businesses, but fearful of what the future might hold. So imagine, you know, let's say you're doing pretty good. And I said, well, there's a recession coming. Even though things are pretty good, you would automatically start to kind of cut back and be more conservative. Yeah. So sometimes just the perception of fear is enough. And so that's what you're seeing mm -hmm. in the market. And so sales reps who are going out and companies going out who are executing the same tactics that may have worked even a year ago mm -hmm. are finding that they're not working anymore because companies are taking a much more kind of conservative approach to their investments. Got it. Yeah. So just being mindful and like you said, those things that where average that sales reps were doing aren't really going to work right now. And I love that example you put in with Zoom because, yeah, if I worked at Zoom, then I would probably be a pretty popular sales mm -hmm. rep too, or feeling really good about myself, even though maybe I didn't have a lot to do with it. But, and this is where, you know, I've read from some of your content too, where sales reps should be leading with problems. So could you tell us what you mean by that? 
Yeah, well, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges is that a lot of sales reps, especially in the technology space, they tend to fall in love with their products, right? Like, <laughs> and, and in fact, you know, we, we might get to this a little bit later on, but one of the biggest challenges is that as we try to train our reps, a lot of the training that we give our reps and the sales process that we put in play is all geared around the product. So it's mm -hmm. like, get them to the demo, get them to the POC, get them to the business case, ask them these, you know, kind of questions and then just kind of show them the thing. And then, you know, <laughs> their minds are going to be blown. And so, and so in, in a time where, you know, customers really, and I've said this for years, like they don't care about your product. And, you know, a little bit of like the empathy that I brought being a Salesforce customer a few times before they acquired my startup and I ended up working there was I would tell my reps, I'm like, your customers don't care about us. They don't care about you. They don't care about your quota. They don't care about our products. They only care about one thing, which is themselves and their problems and solving those problems. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, especially in the tech space, again, we're conditioned to lead with products yeah. and get them to the demo, especially as we have a lot of like younger sales reps, the average age of a seller is getting less. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we don't feel, this is a whole other thing, but sometimes we don't feel comfortable going toe to toe with the customers that we're being asked to call on. It's and true. so it's like this mechanism of safety, just get them to the product, just show them the thing. Mm -hmm. And again, our customers aren't focused on that. And they're not really going to get a good sense of like, how awesome your product is just from like a, you know, a quick demo. What we first need to do is we need to, first of all, understand the problem that they're solving, the, the problem that they're experiencing that we can help them solve, but also deepening their appreciation and understanding of that problem and why they haven't been able to solve it on their own. So, you know, if I said, Hey, look, you know, you, you know, do you want to get in shape? You'd be like, Oh, sure. Like I want to get in shape and be strong and all that kind of stuff. And, and I said, great, let me show you my gym and my whatever, my workout routine. And I got all these videos and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you may not be focused on A, the product, and B, you might not appreciate the priority associated mm -hmm. with trying to get in shape. Maybe it's not that important to you. Yeah. And so deepening a customer's appreciation of the problem is mm -hmm. the most important thing we can do to get them to lean in and say, well, tell me more. What, how, how can you help? Mm, got it. So yeah, deepening that understanding from there. And then I like the way that you put it is, you know, understanding the problem that they're having solving that problem. And I think I just had an aha moment when you were talking earlier that the age of sales reps is getting lower and lower. And I, I mean, I started in sales when I was 22. And from what you're saying, it's like, you feel comfortable. Like I'm remembering when I'm I was 22. You feel comfortable thinking like, okay, I'm going to do less of the talking and more of the showing of a product because the product is going to be more important than me talking about their problems, if that makes sense. So it's like, do you feel like there's kind of this, because like sales reps almost being scared because they don't, they don't feel like they're in the position yet to be the, um, the expert or have that expert knowledge to keep talking with those people. Cause that's, kind of what I thought about when you were just saying that to me. Oh, Maggie, you've opened Pandora's box now. <laughs> I have, there's a, I have a ton of, I wrote an article in Harvard Business Review a few years ago. It was called mm -hmm. how younger salespeople can win um, older buyers or older customers. Yeah. And uh, in that, I talk about this in my book and I have an article on my website. Uh, I call it, you know, experience asymmetry, this concept mm -hmm. of like this imbalance, right? Like when you're mm -hmm. a younger, less experienced seller, calling on a more senior, more experienced buyer whose job you've never done. Yeah. Which is actually, and I say like younger, you don't have to be 22 calling on a 50 year old customer. <laughs> you could be, you know, an experienced seller, even calling on a new, you know, uh, like new to your company. And you mm -hmm. don't know like the pattern, you don't know the narrative yet. And you're calling someone again, whose job you've never done. That describes like 99% of sales, totally. right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, and I noticed this at Salesforce, so I used to run small business for the Eastern US. So I had mm -hmm. reps in different cities and my New York city sales reps would always hustle the most, the most calls, the most emails, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> but sometimes I would have these reps that would have tons of activity and no pipeline. Mm -hmm. So I would start asking them like, so Maggie, what's, what's going on? Do you not have enough accounts? Do you not calling people at the right time? Do you not know what to say? And they're like, no, 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 David, I'm doing all those things. So I'd have no recourse just to listen to their calls. I mean, I just have to listen to some of the calls and maybe I can yeah. pick something up. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine you're in my position. I'm just closing my eyes and, I, and I'm just listening for whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening and I'm like, Maggie, it, 
it sounds to me like you're bothering this customer. Like, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like the way my kids sound when they're about to ask me for something that they already think I'm going to say no to, right? <laughs> that's such a borrowing the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, borrowing the my, my daughter, she's, she's, um, she has a 6 a.m. volleyball practice at her, she's on the team at her school. And she comes down to my office late at night and she's like, and she's forgotten. So she needs a lift at 6 a.m. Yeah. So she comes down to my office and she's like, Dad, how, how much do you love me? And I'm like, the answer is no, right? Like I'm immediately defensive. Yeah. And so 1000% when we're young, when we're less experienced, calling on more senior you know, buyers, and we're a little bit afraid about the value that we're adding because we're not mm -hmm. curing cancer. We're not feeding children in starving third world countries. A lot yeah. of us in our space that we're selling technology, we're selling services. And so we're afraid and customers can feel the manifestation of that fear in your tone, in your words. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't come in there being, and by the way, it's not just being able to focus on the problems, but I have a lot of clients that say, yeah, like David, we have this great script and narrative. And then the customer asks us something or objects and says, oh, this is too expensive or it's not a priority or we're going to solve this mm -hmm. on our own. And then the reps are like, shoot, I don't, I don't know how to respond to this. And then they get completely thrown off their game. So if I'm locked into a script, like ask this, ask this, ask this, get them to the demo. And then something yeah. happens. I have no basis to, you know, to, 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 you know, recover from that. And so, and customers can feel that. And the second they feel that fear, they lose interest because all of a sudden the conviction's gone. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And making sure that, yeah, that can read through on a call. I mean, even at the beginning of this call, I was nervous to talk with you, David, <laughs> probably showed through a little bit, but I have listened back to my own calls of where I definitely felt nervous. And also when you're getting at that level with a, um, like when you're digging deeper in discovery, I feel like that's where, when I first started doing it, it started to feel really unnatural. I felt uncomfortable because, you know, I, well, at first I don't think I was doing it the right way, but second, yeah, just like talking about those things where I thought like, Oh, I'm just going to show the product because I'm more confident that like, if they see it, that if I stop talking as much or whatever, um, that it's just all going to work out there. And I think you brought up a good point of like, we have all these frameworks and, um, scripts that we use. And that feels really good when you're young because you're like, okay, I'm still learning things, things like that, et cetera. Um, but then there should be some creativity in there, or there should be some lean into being curious and digging deeper with problems. And that's a lot of what I've, what has helped me become a better sales rep. But the big question I have is how do you find that balance between the process, like that script, and then the creative freedom for those sales reps? Mm -hmm. Well, this is why sales is hard <laughs> and we don't pay high school students minimum wage to do it, <laughs> you know, at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Um, and exactly kind of what you said, like sometimes we get too pigeonholed into like our narrative and there's no room for creativity and there's no room mm -hmm. for curiosity. You know, I hear this complaint from a lot of my clients, which is, you know, our reps are, you know, if I can paraphrase, like our reps are really good at playing sheet music, but not jazz. Like they don't know how to improvise when something kind of goes off course. And so if we just uh -huh. teach them how to do this thing, then, you know, then we're going to be challenged. And so again, like my advice is to help your reps really understand like the nature of the problem. In fact, you know, what I tell my clients is I'm like, you should be able to get 75% of the way through mm -hmm. your initial pitch or your first call deck or whatever it is without even talking about what you do, because what you do is irrelevant, right? If I can talk to you about the problem you're experiencing and deepen your awareness of the problem and why you haven't been able to solve it on your own until now, Mm -hmm. You will automatic and not even talking about what it is I do, you will yeah. automatically think that I'm in a position to help you solve the problem. For example, we are talking now about concepts like experience asymmetry and stifling our natural curiosity by being too like, you know, locked into a script. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about all these things. And hopefully you can feel and if you're listening out there, you can feel number one, I love what I do, right? <laughs> I love what I do. And I hope you can feel it. Mm -hmm. But also like I've seen this a lot. Now, mm -hmm. you don't even know really like what I do, what my business actually does. We mm -hmm. haven't even really talked about that. And it doesn't matter because if you've been listening to some of these problems and challenges and now you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, like, yeah, like I, I, maybe you started listening to this episode 
And maybe you didn't fully appreciate, you know, the gravity of the situation that you or your reps found yourselves in or why it's been so challenging selling in this environment. And now you're listening to me saying, oh, you know what? You know, I, I, by the way, I'm not, I'm not, not being <laughs> braggadocious. I'm stepping outside myself <laughs> to say, like, maybe you're listening and saying, you know what? This makes a lot of sense. I wonder what this guy does, right? Mm. And then you're going to go to my website or you're going to check out, like, and it, and it almost doesn't matter, again, what I do. Yeah. You're leaning in. You're saying like I, you know, hopefully I'm I'm I get everything you're saying, David. And it sounds like because if you're talking about this stuff, that it's something you've seen a lot, and maybe you can help us. It's it's no different than, you know. And I I'll give a shout out to my sister. She's a fitness coach, so she's all on the Instagram okay. and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's my she's my little sister. She's 44. She has three uh, kids, and she specifically coaches women over 40 who are trying mm -hmm. to get in really great shape. Okay. And so what does she do? She doesn't go out there and say, hey, I'm such and such and I have a program and da 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 because like no one cares, right? Mm -hmm. She goes out there and she says, you know, hey, women over 40. So all of a sudden people are paying attention. Mm -hmm. And she says, like, if you're trying to get in shape, you're probably struggling, you know, and you're struggling to do that. There's a number of reasons why, you know, you're mm -hmm. having that problem. One of the biggest reasons women over 40 struggle to get in shape is they skip breakfast. Are you mm -hmm. skipping breakfast? Let me tell you, like, here's the bad thing about skipping breakfast. And she goes into that thing. And now, if you're a woman over 40 and you're trying to get in great shape and you're thinking to yourself, oh, shoot, I am skipping breakfast. Okay, let me <laughs> let me listen to this. And then she can go deeper. She'll say, and look, even if you said, okay, great, now I got I to gotta have breakfast now. Mm -hmm. The question is, well, what should I have? Right? Because mm -hmm. I can still choose the wrong thing. So you see, yeah. not only am I talking about the problem you're experiencing, but now I'm talking about the problem with the problem. And I can keep going deeper. Even once you decided, okay, here's what I need to, to eat in terms of you know, food groups and stuff. The question is like portion size and like how often, at what time of the morning? So like, I, this is not my area of expertise. What so brand I have no idea. too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what so I'm like, thinking about. <laughs> you just keep going deeper and deeper into the mm -hmm. problem. Now, by the way, I'm not suggesting if you're listening to this, that you kind of fear monger and, and talk mm -hmm. about fears. And also you don't have to go through that whole problem spectrum. I'm going to have a conversation with you, Maggie, and depending on what I learn about you and where you are on that spectrum, like mm -hmm. maybe you're a woman over 40 and you're not interested in getting in shape. So like maybe I need to start further upstream or maybe you're a woman over 40 who's interested in getting in shape and you already know that you should be eating breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start further down the spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the kind of the point of discoveries to figure out where your customer is on that journey. So I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting you just kind of come out guns a blazing with like problems all over the place. <laughs> yeah. The problems still have to be- Overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Overwhelming, for sure. Mm -hmm. The problems still have to be focused and tailored. And it should also feel like human, like you're having a discussion with a person, not someone who's reading off a script and politely interrogating you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like that you put the word interrogating at the end of it because so many times, and I've made this mistake myself, where, um, you can be really good at finding out those problems. You can be really good at talking with them, but you don't have any empathy alongside them going through the journey of it. So like saying, Hey, don't worry. I've had someone in this position before. And I've actually, actually accidentally skipped that before. And I come across listening back to it. Like, Oh my gosh, did I just make that person feel bad for having this problem that most people do? Um, and I laugh at myself now because I'm like, I, de I definitely did like unintentionally because not what not really was it a script but i was so focused on like okay i need to you know portray this problem to them talk about it with them that i actually forgot that one little piece of it that i think could have helped me a little bit better too 100 percent. no look you know <laughs> being human and just like having that human conversation it changes the whole feel you know that mm -hmm. you have you know with that other person uh especially if that other person is again older more experienced because on one hand, they're thinking in the back of their in the back of their head, like, who the hell is this kid, or who the hell is yeah. this person? Yeah. And what are they going to teach me about, you know, <laughs> running my business? And I was like you. I started my career in sales. I was twenty five. I was we were selling a, an enterprise workforce management software mm -hmm. product, and so I would go into like banks and manufacturing organizations and mm -hmm. airlines, and I and I was a solution engineer, by the way. So shout out to all the SCs out there. Like I would yeah. do custom coding for demos and doing mm -hmm. all these things. And people would joke, and I talk about this in the articles, like people would joke that they had systems at their company that were older than I was, right? <laughs> and they themselves had been, you know, working there longer than I'd been alive. Makes and you so, feel good. <laughs> yeah, like, so I'm like, okay, well, shoot, now what, I'm, what am I supposed to do now? Like, <laughs> yeah. I, need to, I need to overcome that imbalance. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And the way I overcame that imbalance was through this combination of like conviction with the right stories. Like you don't have to know everything about everything, mm -hmm. but as you kind of go through your sales journey, picking up pieces of information, customer stories, weaving them into your narrative, even if you look or and or seem young, the mm -hmm. second you open your mouth, there's no reason why they can't see that yeah. you have tons of conviction and relevant experience in their field if you're mm -hmm. saying and doing the right things. Absolutely. Well, if that is an advice for people out there that are just breaking into sales, I don't know what it is. David, thank you so, so much for going through that and just talking about some of these nuances that are going on during this economic downturn and how we can help that with problems. I always leave off instead of where can people find you, which we've kind of already mentioned here, your LinkedIn profile, probably your website, if you don't mind shouting that out again. Yeah, CerebralSelling.com uh, is where you'll find everything, blogs, my YouTube <laughs> channel is Cerebral Selling. So yeah, just perfect. Just there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I just want to finish off with one last question for you, just kind of a, a quick one here. Besides your own book, what's a book that you'd recommend to a seller out there today? Yeah, so one of my you know, favorite sales books is Dan Pink's To Sell is Human. I'm a big mm -hmm. Dan Pink fan. And I think it's, you know, it's a great book that harmonizes kind of you know, a little bit of the science of selling as well as just like the humanity of mm -hmm. it. Uh, and I'm a big fan of Dan Pink and the research he puts in. So that's a book I would highly suggest reading. Amazing, yeah. amazing, the best of both. Well, David, thank you so, so much for being on here. And thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Shake Sales. We'll catch you next time.